Good morning. Um, so we've formally made a start. I noticed there's some questions coming in in the chat, so it's probably easier for me to answer them verbally. Um, so I will start with Gavin's question. Um, I'm assuming you're Gavin at EPCC, but you may not be. Um, the uh, So no, um, Anaconda is not currently on Archer 2. Um, and this morning, we are not. I, I won't be using Archer for the walkthrough. I'll be doing it from my own laptop. Um, we're not going to be doing very Archer two specific things this morning. But when Michael comes on this afternoon, he will show you some other things, um, uh, including sort of working with libraries and so on. So um, the the libraries that we will be using so anaconda is a distribution a python distribution but the libraries that we will be using uh, are available um, and you can uh, install them locally yourself and i expect uh, in, the, in the medium term they will appear in archer too as well um, but uh, if you do have the chance to download anaconda then um, then that's what i would recommend for this morning's session because that's what we we're intending to go through. Dinesh, um, you've asked whether it's paid software. Anaconda uh, has, um, I think, an enterprise version or something that you can pay for. But the, the free version, there is a free open source version of a, on Anaconda that has everything that you will need today. And um, most people just use the free version. So it's cross-platform, available for Linux, Windows, Mac OS. Um, and it's free of charge, so that's the distribution that we recommend. But there are other distributions of Python, and as you'll be able to get the libraries another way. Um, but Anaconda is just a nice packaged up version that has everything that we will, will need, almost everything. I'll point out one other thing at the start of the course that I'm going to suggest that people download for later today. So hopefully that answers your question, Dinesh. So again, hello to those people who are already here. I've not really made a start yet, but I noticed there are some questions coming in in the chat. So I will just uh, answer those while I'm here. And um, there's a question about logging into Archer. For this morning's session, for what I'm going to talk to you about with the um, data analysis in Python, we're just going to be using your own laptop, your own desktop machine. Um, ideally, you will have installed the Anaconda distribution if you want to walk along and have everything work exactly the same as what, what uh, I'm doing. Um, otherwise, you can you can uh, watch and, and follow along um, what I'm doing. But uh, you won't need to log into Archer for this morning. For this afternoon, you will be uh, led through this, I think. So uh, let's start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Juan Herrera. I work at EPCC. I'm. A, I will be today a helper of the of the course, and what I will do is I will introduce uh, what uh, we will see uh, uh, today. So uh, first of all, uh, as uh, you may know, uh, this uh, course is under the Archer Two uh, Code of uh, Conduct. Uh, this code, uh, I mean the the summary of it is. Uh, uh, code of conduct is uh, be kind uh, each other, but uh, be more like a more uh, explaining it uh, longer is uh, use a welcoming and inclusive uh, language, uh, be respectful of uh, different uh, viewpoints and experiences, and gratefully accept uh, construct, uh, co constructive uh, criticism, uh, focus on what is uh, best for the community, and so uh, courtesy and respect uh, towards other uh, community members. So uh, this is uh, the schedule for today. Uh, first, uh, we will have a, an hour uh, of, uh, of course. Then we will have a morning break of uh, 15 minutes. Then we will have another hour. This uh, first part is uh, Adam will teach uh, this part and we will be more focused on the uh, data science part of uh, Python, how to use uh, Python for, uh, for managing data, plotting, etc. Then we will have a lunch break, and after the lunch break, uh, uh, a colleague of mine uh, will explain uh, more about uh, how to use uh, Archer 2 uh, 
to uh, to run some uh, Python uh, codes. For questions, uh, as I said, I, I'll be around and I will uh, answer the questions uh, via the via chat. Also, if uh, you want to uh, ask the question, boys, uh, you can uh, click on raise hand that is on the bottom of your screen and you can unmute uh, yourself. Also, we have this uh, collaborative uh, part that uh, you can use uh, to, uh, I will paste the link in the, in the chat. And yes, I will, uh, as I said, uh, Adam will uh, introduce uh, this uh, first uh, part of the course. So uh, Adam, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Juan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Adam Carter. I'm uh, from EPCC, and uh, I'm the program director of the Data Science Technology and Innovation Program at the University of Edinburgh. I also teach our EPCC's own masters in high performance computing and data science. Uh, what I don't have yet is a lot of experience on Archer 2. I haven't been directly involved in Archer 2. So I think um, my uh, colleagues Juan and uh, I believe Michael later this afternoon will be able to help you more with things that are specific to Archer. Um, but this morning I'm going to introduce uh, how to do some um, basic data analysis using uh, Python and in particular using Pandas, uh, which is a library for, for Python. Um, so I think this is built as an intermediate course. It's intermediate in that I'm already assuming that you can do well, that you're familiar with Python. Um, so I'm not going to go completely from scratch in that respect. It's actually not particularly uh, advanced when it comes to the data analysis part. So um, what we're not really going to be doing today is any of, of the fancy data science, the um, uh, the machine learning and things like that, that, uh, that you can get onto. But what we'll cover today is um, and a necessary prerequisite for all of that anyway. And it's useful in its own right. So what we'll do today is sort of cover some basic data analysis, just manipulation of data, um, how Python works with data. Uh, and, um, and so that's what I will be focusing on today. If you do have questions about the more advanced stuff, I'm certainly happy to take those indeed questions about, um, do, do please interrupt me to ask questions as, um, as uh, Juan said, Please feel free to raise your virtual hand and, and interrupt me. Um, so uh, I'll try to remember to leave some time for questions as we go along, but, but it's best that you ask things as they occur to you. So I'm very happy to take questions as we go through today. I know it's a bit harder to do um, these things remotely, uh, but do make the most of the fact that, that we're around and uh, you, can, you can ask questions when you have them. Um, I don't know if, if Juan pointed it out, but as usual for these Archer training uh, sessions, they are being recorded, um, so just so that you're aware of that as well. But I hope that doesn't inhibit you from ask, asking any questions and things like that, because it's better that you better that you ask. All right. So um, what I'm going to do now is share my screen, and what I sh uh, the way I've decided to run today uh, is. I don't have any slides. I'm not going to present you. Um, I'm not going to tell you things. I'm going to spend most of the day showing you things. Um, I would like you, if possible, to, um, to walk along with me to try these things that I'm doing as we go. Uh, indeed, um, I'll stop occasionally as we go through uh, to give you the chance to, to try something out yourself before I I give the answer, but there will there will just be sort of short breaks, two to five minutes uh, for you to be working through stuff rather than a whole practical set. So, um, so do try to follow on if you can, um, and, uh, and yeah. So the, the first thing that I should do is to sort of check that you have um, what you will will need to follow on today. So I think it was suggested uh, in the. The, the communications before the course that you should try to download the Anaconda distribution. So if you've got a load of Python things already installed, you may not need the Anaconda distribution because we're not doing anything particularly fancy. 
but if you want to have the same setup as me, that is uh, is what I would recommend. Um, we're also going to be basing today's uh, trade session on training materials that were created by Data Carpentry. Um, I will post a link now into the chat. Um, so this is the lesson that we're going to walk through. Um, and so you may or may, or may not be familiar with that, but so we're going to pick out certain parts of this and, and walk through it. Uh, we're not going to start right at the start. We're going to just go here, um, starting with the starting with data part. Um, I'm going to assume that you already are have some familiarity with Python. So, um, so yeah. So I would suggest that you open the link that I have pasted here at the side. Um, so Dinesh. Um, see that you have an issue with your um, Anaconda application. Um, I don't know what that might be. I don't know, Juan, if you're available, maybe you could troubleshoot with Dinesh while I do the general set. Um, yeah. OK, thank you. Um, so, I was, so to start Anaconda, um, you can normally do that uh, by clicking on the icon, and you'll probably see something like this. Anaconda Navigator, um, or if you're happy working at the command line, or you can start up your notebook from the command line. So I can either click Launch here to launch my notebook, or I can type um, Jupyter Notebook like this. What that does um, is it opens up a tab, or it opens up a window in my web browser, um, which at the moment, okay, the screen share is frozen. I'm sorry about that. Let me turn off the video. Hopefully that will help. Um, so uh, good. Yeah, let me know if you if you can't see. Can you can somebody confirm that they can see my screen now? Not yet. Still frozen. Okay. Let's give it a moment to catch up. If it doesn't, then uh, I can maybe. Try something else like logging out. Uh, I'll just check that I'm not using any bandwidth for anything else. I'll pause all my background syncing and so on. I think it's already paused. Okay. Right. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Now. Good. Right. Um, Sorry, hopefully we won't have too many of these moments today. Right, um, good. So, uh, so when you open the notebook, either by clicking here on the Jupyter notebook, or by starting the notebook, the command line is the line Jupyter notebook. It should open up a web page, and uh, it's going to show you the files and directories in your directory. Suggest that we go somewhere where you can work your, your doc folder or create a uh, directory that you you want to work in. Um, and uh, let's start with a, an empty um, an empty folder, an empty directory. Okay, so let me two things side by side actually, just to give you um, a view of what you can see. So. Um, just me a, some idea of whether people are uh, okay. Yeah, just give me some idea of whether people can um, are, are at the state where they can follow along. If you can give me a, say yes or no in the um, uh, in the chat, if you uh, if you're able to see something like this, if you're able to get Jupyter Notebook open in your web browser. So some yeses. That's great. Fine. Um, so the next thing to do then is to uh, download files that we'll need for this session. So um, so we're starting now with this page here, starting with data, and it says that we're, we're going 
we'll be using files from the portal project teaching database and we're going to use this file surveys.csv so this is the only one i think that we're going to need to download just now um, so let's uh, um, let's click on this link and that will download the file to your computer um, i'm now going to put that file into the, the directory that I'm going to be working in, um, just so that it's handy. Guess you can do that however you want. Um, I should uh, now be, I, I just refreshed the page there to see it. Um, so that's the data file that we're going to be working with. It's just a CSV file, a comma separated value file. Um, Showing some tabular data, I clicked on here, and then in a moment, hopefully, it will open up and you can see what's what's in it. Um, so just a plain text file. Um, it's got some uh, some data about um, some species that have been observed in various different plots and different um, parts of. of uh, where a survey was being undertaken um, and, and certain things have been measured about uh, these different um, species that have been found here including their sex the hind foot length and their weight for example it's recorded in this this table here. so that's all that's in the csv file and let me close that for a moment um, and now uh, we can start um, a python notebook so i'm going to go to new Going to go to new, hopefully. Is that, yeah. I'll choose Python D. And that starts um, the session. So we're working with a notebook today. And the advantage of that is later on when we come to do some plotting, uh, everything will just work in line. And the notebook interface is quite a nice way of looking at the plots quite quickly. Um, it's good for doing your exploratory data analysis where, where this kind of data manipulation is so useful. Um, you, you can also run this at the command line, depending on how you have it set up, it will either open additional windows to show you the plots when you get to that, or it may save plots as files in your directory that you have to open with some um, additional program. Um, but just to keep things simple today, I'm going to use the, the Jupyter Notebook. All right, so um, the first thing that we're going to do is to import pandas. So pandas is uh, um, the most popular data manipulation library for Python. Um, we're going to import it as PD. The PD is just the shorthand so that we can refer to it because we're going to be using it a lot. Um, and if you have downloaded Anaconda, you will already have um, it installed, so it should import nicely. Um, questions from someone? Or, uh, just a mic open. Okay, I'll carry on just now. So I'm importing pandas, um, and uh, um, and so now let's move on down. And we're going to read in the CSV file into something called a data frame. So I'll ex explain what a data frame is in a moment. Um, so we're going to read the CSV file that we have in using this method, read CSV, that is part of pandas. And if I do this, the first thing we see is an error, and that's a deliberate mistake. I thought I would start off with um, an error, just as we'll probably encounter various of the various uh, ones of these as we go through. Um, the best place to look, by the way, for these long Python errors is normally right at the bottom. It tells you um, probably the information that you'll need to know. So data surveys.csv does not exist. OK, so it was looking for surveys.csv in what called data. Um, it didn't tell us to put it there, but let, let's fix that. So. Um, going to create a 
new uh, folder. So you can do this in the shell and move things around or, or graphical windows, however you want. I'm going to just do it in the Jupyter interface here to show you how to do it. Um, so I'm going to get a new folder. I'm going to, and I'm going to select it, click rename and call it data. I'm going to select service.csv and I'm going to say move and put it into data. Um, okay, so this you can also see this untitled PYNB here. This is my Python notebook that I'm running here. Um, so now I put it into data. I can run this cell again. If return to run a cell. You can already work that out. And um, this is now showing me the contents of the data frame. With 35,000 rows, it's not showing all of the rows. It uh, just gives me um, a snippet of the data frame. So where can we find the data? So when you downloaded the data, um, so, so first of all, the data is available from this URL. Yeah, I'll just paste it into the chat as well. Just so it's accessible. Um, and if you click on that, that will download the CSV file to your local computer. So then you have to move it to the directory, to the folder where you're going to, to work with it. Um, can you please remind us how to launch the notebook? The screen froze for me at the vital moment. Okay, yeah, sorry. I'd rather people manage to. So thank you for asking these questions. Uh, I would rather people were able to follow along. So from the command line, type Jupyter Notebook, or you can launch the Anaconda Navigator from your start menu or however you do want to. With spotlight search, you're on a map. Um, I think it's in the application. Download to the normal place your applications are, and then you can click Launch on Jupyter Notebook. Um, so you either click here to launch it or type Jupyter Notebook at the command line. All right. Um, so, uh, one question. Okay. So, um, here we are, uh, and we'll go back to the notebook, and here's our data frame. So, um, we can see that we've we've got most of the contents of the data frame here. Um, and let us, so, so at the moment we just, we've read this in, but we didn't store it anywhere, but we are going to want to manipulate it. So let's do the same thing now, but we'll store this. We'll store the output into a variable that we're going to call surveys underscore df. All right. So, um, so now I can look at that whenever I want. And uh, there we go. So one thing that you'll quite frequently want to do um, is just to pick out the start of one of these data frames. So the notebook prints it out quite nicely anyway, but if you just want the first few lines, uh, it's quite useful to type use the head method. So this is a Python method on this object, uh, and it prints out the first few lines of the data frame. Um, another thing that you might want to know is what is this thing? What is it? What is a data frame? And you can ask it what the Python type of that is, and you can see that it comes from pandas, and it is, it is a data frame. So. Um, a data frame is a two-dimensional object for storing tabular data. Um, a little bit like a 2D array, but you can notice that this data frame has different types in the different columns. Um, so each column has a particular data type associated with it, um, but different columns can have different data types associated with it. You can actually see what those data type types are um, by uh, looking at this attribute of the data frame. Um, it is an attribute of the data frame. It doesn't, so it doesn't have brackets here. 
this is calling it a method on the data frame, so it does have brackets. And we can see the different types um, of the columns in this data. So we've got 64-bit integers for most of it. We've got objects here, which is just the pandas way of um, referring to strings. So there isn't a specific string type here. So anything that is a string, like the species ID or the sex, is just going to be shown as an object. Um, and these last two columns are 64-bit floating point numbers questions. You have to click run to make the line runner. So, okay, the keyboard shortcut that I'm using, sorry, you can't see that, um, is uh, shift return. So um, if I um, so if I just type return on its own, it gives me a new line. If I type shift return, it runs the, the line straight away. Okay. Yeah, a bit quicker than trying to run from the different steps up at the top, selecting the cells and you know, getting them to run. Um, okay, so these are the different data types associated with the, the data frame. Um, and uh, so we're um, so we're coming to the point where uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you just to try something yourself for a moment, and then I'll show you how to do it. So in these data carpentry exercises, there are occasional challenges. Um, the, uh, the beginning ones aren't particularly challenging, but let's, these are things that you can, can try yourself, um, and then I will walk through the answer. So try out these things before you Press shift return, try and think what you would hope that it would return, um, see if it does what you expect. So uh, I'll give you a few minutes to look at that, and then you can, um, and I'll walk you through. And good point from Ian. Um, so something that uh, that you can, you can do, just a, a little tip. Um, one of the features that Jupyter Notebooks has, that's something that also you can get in some shells, like the IPython shell, that you can also launch from. So this IPython shell here gives you a command line interface, but with a, a few extra little things like syntax highlighting and, and, um, and call tips and, um, and completion. So one thing, if I start typing something, surveys underscore data frame and I press tab, it will complete that for me. Um, similarly, uh, if I want to um, want to see what all the possible methods or attributes are for an object, I can type the dot and then press tab and it will actually list them all here. Um, so that's a good way of quickly uh, remembering what you might want to type next and if there is a choice then it'll present you with that and you to, to choose from um, another thing that you might want to do is to get some documentation on a particular type if you put the question mark after something it will normally either in line or in an appropriate place open some documentation for the object that you're working with so that's another good tip right <coughs> Excuse me. So let, let's have a look at then what the, the answer to this challenge was. Um, so it says, see what these things return. So as you might guess, this returns the columns of the data frame, or at least the, the names of the columns. What you've actually got here is some kind of index object. You don't really need to understand in detail what this thing is. Um, I can pick out the names of the columns um, using this kind of notation if you just want uh, wanted one column. But, um, so you can use it like a list. But what we actually have here is an index object that behind the scenes, if you've got very large data frames, um, it means that you can, can access different parts of it a bit more efficiently. So it returns something uh, that is an index that you can do various things with. You can treat it like a list of the different um, column names. I think I saw a question. 
So the first problem is the yes, we'll, we will come on to that uh, indeed. So Python um, uses a zero indexing, and that is true in pandas as well. So by default, we have zero um, indexing. So the first element in, in a list is uh, zero. So if I have, I'm just making myself a quick list, one, two, three, and I ask for element zero, Gives me the one. If I ask for element three, that's beyond the end list, and I get an error. Okay. Um, so uh, next, surveys. Df underscore shape. I saw a question about C call the rows instead of columns. So we will come on to that. Uh, I'm just going to, rather than. Uh, in fact, I'm going to come on to that in some detail. <laughs> so I'll I'll save it for later. That's all right, um, so that uh, I'm not dumping around too much. So the um, uh, if we look at shape, what we get is this thing back, um, which has the number of rows and the number of columns in the data frame. It says what format does it return it in, and then it says that. Say, <laughs> More on tuples here, so as well, it gives the game away, as, as these challenges quite often do. Um, but if I uh, did want to see what type this thing was, I could also use type, and I can see that it is a tuple. So a tuple is just, um, uh, it's, it's a bit like a list, but it's depicted in Python with the, the round brackets rather than the square brackets. Um, Okay, so what did, uh, we have already seen head from the, the top of the list. If I want to see the first nine items, for example, I can type that and it gives me um, the first nine rows. And similarly, I can ask for the last few rows or the last rows. Way of just looking at, at parts of, of the of the table to pick our individual rows we'll come on to in due course. Okay, so let's um let's do our first bit of some sort of exploratory data analysis. We're going to get a list of all the species that we have in this data frame. And um uh, what we want is, so we can see some species here, PB, US, AH, but you can see some of them are repeated. What we want is a list with just each possible species ID listed once. And that is what the unique method does. So I can use this kind of syntax and say, um, give me all the unique values from this column of the data frame. And it gives me this back as an array at another Python um, sort of container object. So we've had arrays, lists, tuples, indexes, data frames. Um, yeah. It is a little bit confusing. Thankfully, you can often move between these um, uh, um, fairly straightforwardly. So there was a question about if we have um, head or tail, can we store these in a new data frame? And the answer is Yes, you can just do something like this, and uh, when I look at the data frame, I've just got the last big rows. So, uh, um, so yeah, it's quite possible to, to do that kind of thing. Um, good. So. Uh, so we have all so we got, had all the different possible species IDs here. So I'd like you now to try um, again just a couple of minutes. Can you try the same thing and see if you can get a list of unique plot uh, IDs? So this sometimes refers them to site IDs, but it does actually tell you that the column is called plot ID. So um, Try and get that list and store it in something called site names so that we can use it later. Um, and then see if you can see how many unique sites there are in the data. And again, if you look further down the challenge, 
get a hint as to how to do that. So um, have a go at that for two minutes, and then I'll walk you through it. OK, let's have a look then. So we're, we're doing something very similar to what we did before, as you probably realized. So um, this time, we're going to pick out the plot ID. Um, and it says to store it in something called site names. Do that. So I'm I, so doing here step by step building up the command. It's something that I quite commonly do. Um, incidentally, I never really showed you because we, we've been working with particular columns, but I don't think I've actually pulled out one column. So this is what happens when you pull out a single column from a data frame. Um, and what that is in pandas is to this as a series okay so um series you can do nearly everything you uh, that you can do to a data frame to a series the series is the one dimensional object that tends to represent a column everything of the same type and um, the data frame is the is the two dimensional object um, so how many unique sites are there in this thing site names that we've just created there's different ways you can do that. I can just ask for the length of the object that I've created of my um, my series. Uh, in fact, is, is, it, is that a series as well? Site names. Actually, no. It's a, a num numpy array. Um, Just a just an array, um, but you can call length on it as well. Um, so, is there a function for a series? Uh, I think there is. So, if I just take a column, that's my head. I can just see the top of a series. And um, once I have my site names, I don't think I can. Head of an array. No. So yeah, so you can yes, you can use head on a series, but no, you can't use it on an array. Um right. So yeah, so I, I used length here of site names to get the um, the number of different plots that we have. Uh, I can also use this syntax. So rather than calling unique to actually get the list of unique values, they can just call n unique. And that tells me how many unique values I have. And it gives the same answer exactly the same. So just as is quite common in Python and pandas in particular, there's normally more than one way of doing something. So you can work with what uh, works best for you. Talking of there being more than one way of doing something, um, so this we've used this syntax to pick out a, a column. You can actually treat the column as if they are attributes of the data frame. So I can use this syntax with a dot to get exactly the same thing out. So this is, can be a nice shorthand. You've got to be a little bit careful if you start to use things that have the same name as methods or attributes from surveys data frame. So personally, I recommend the safe option um, of using a slightly longer notation that is unambiguous. Um, but just may see it um, sometimes in Python code. So you should know that it's equivalent uh, in the case where there is no, <laughs> there's no uh, attribute with the same name. So, so far we've kind of been manipulating these data frames, but we haven't done any statistics or any kind of uh, that kind of analysis with the data. Um, so the, the very first kind of descriptive uh, the exploratory data analysis you might want to do is to get some descriptive statistics of the data that you have. So that describes um, things like 
mean values, the standard deviations, the quartiles, and, and so on. Um, maximum, minimum values. And the data frames have this nice uh, method built in called describe. So um, if I pick out the weight column and ask to describe that, uh, it tells me count, that's just how many different values there are, mean value, the standard deviation, the minimum value, the 25th quantile, so the 25th percentile, rather. So that's the first quartile. So one quarter of the data uh, values lie below 20. This is the second quartile, so 37 of the values. Uh, sorry, um, the, uh, half of the data has a value below 37. Three quarters of the data has a value below 48, and so on. Um, and you can pick out individual ones of these um, rather than getting all of the descriptive statistics. So you can use min, max, mean, standard deviation, and that just picks out that single number there. So the mean value of the weight uh, is given by this. Essen is seeing different results. Surveys data from species to n unique and length of the unique values of species ID. Okay, so so we did it with plot ID. So I wonder why these might be different. So let, that's a, a, something worth checking. Um, so um, so the number of different species IDs according to that is forty eight. Um, the length of uh, the list of unique values uh, is 49. So um, what this shows. Um, Maybe easier to see from the unique ones. I think the answer here lies in the not a number that exists in the species IDs but does not exist in the plot IDs. Um, so you've, that's a it's a good point that you've uncovered that they're not entirely equivalent. Um, so it's possible that n unique. An argument that lets you let you so it, it does have a per, an argument to parameter. So if you want it to behave the same. So by default, it is not including not a number in the counts, so which is why you were seeing different answer. If you want it to give exactly the same answer um, as unique, um, you can set any equal to true. Um, thank you for the question. How to get statistics over a specified range of rows only. So um, we'll come back to that if that's OK once we um, uh, once we go on to picking out rows, because you need to pick out the rows before you can um, get statistics just on, on those rows. Um, so the next thing we're going to look at is, is group the data. So one thing that we can do here is to, to group things by sex in this case. So let's have a look at what this grouped data is now that we've grouped it. And we can see, OK, not very interesting, rather opaque object. Um, you can't really see very much uh, about what it's done here. And um, what it has done behind the scenes is create something, a kind of index where uh, the, the values are ready to be summarized. 
in, in a more efficient way. So group by on, on its own doesn't give you something very interesting. What you then you then you need to apply some kind of um, uh, reduction over that data. So now if I ask for the mean value on the grouped data, I see something a bit different. Rather than getting um, the mean value uh, of just the record ID, the month, the day, the year, the plot ID, and so on, I'm getting separately calculated mean values for female and male. Um, so here I have the mean value of each quantity. Um, so as it says here, the group by command is powerful in that it allows us to quickly generate summary statistics. So we have a little challenge now, something for you to try. Um, a bit longer this one, I'm going to give you know, three minutes or so. See if you can have a go at this um, and see if you can see how many different individuals from the samples here are female, how many are male, um, and so on. So have a look at that and I'll pick it up in the next couple of minutes. It groups the sex in each plot and gives the mean value. The third command is showing error. My site is not defined. Okay, so um, yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll explain that. Right, um, so it says how many recorded individuals are female and how many are male? Um, so what we want to do here, we're just simply counting things up. Um, so we can take the data that we've already grouped and count it. And um, we can actually see, so it gives a count for all the different values. Um, one thing we can see in this data, probably worth checking when you know the number of rows and so on. But what we have here is every item in this list has a record ID. Um, indeed, they've all got months and days as well, but some of these numbers are lower because there isn't a hind foot length recorded and there may not be a weight recorded. So the safe thing to do often is to find what is effectively a key, to the table, if you're thinking of it like a database table, so something where there is a, a value for, uh, on every row. Um, and I'm just using count. So I can see the answer from just looking at this table. But if I wanted to be more specific, I can pick out the, the record ID and actually just get the two values for female and male. Indeed, programmatically, if I then wanted to get just the number itself, for female, I can use this syntax here, so I can sort of keep drilling down and find the value. So that's how to, to count values. What happens when you group by two columns? Um, well, you will have seen that. Um, Uh, you then get values for every combination of the two things you pick. So here I have um, the mean value of the, I don't know why you'd want the mean value of the month and the day, but you might want to know the mean value of the weight, for example. So here you have the mean value of all the females in plot one, the mean weight of all the males in plot one, the mean weight of all the females in plot two, and so on. So you get um, every different combination out. And then to summarize weight values for each site in your data. Um, hint, you can use the following syntax to only create summary statistics for one column. So um, it's, so we haven't, so, uh, so I think it was asked in the, in the chat that we, that by site was not defined. Um, that's because we haven't created anything called by site. Uh, it's it's just showing you the the syntax here. So um, uh, if we created the group by um, uh, uh, let's do the group by again. But we're going to group it. 
the site this time. So we have plot ID, and we're just going to call this my site. So that's what it was getting at. Maybe not very clear. Um, and once you have that, you can say uh, by site subscribe. And it gives me um, the uh, all the different <laughs> summary statistics. Uh, in fact, it's giving me this long, it's giving me everything and asks specifically about weight here. So let's pick out the weight column like this. I get just the weight now, the summary statistics for each plot um, for weight. As is, um, one thing you can often do is to just do things in a different order and it still gives the same answer. So I could pick out the weight column and then say describe, or I could describe it and then pick out the weight column. It's going to give the, the same, same answer here. Um, okay, uh, so quickly creating summary. Counts. Um, so we want to count the number of samples by species, and we could do it like this, and uh, then print out species counts. Um, so that that's how you do that kind of thing, um, and. So now we can also count just the rows that have the certain species DO. So we're now going to, once we, so we've got something that this is exactly the same as the line above, and we're just going to pick out the value DO here. So we just want this row. And for reasons which I probably won't go into here, but I could go into if anyone's interested later as to why I can using the same syntax as picking out a column and but I just use the square brackets and I pick out a precise value. Um, so um, so the next challenge then what's another way to create a list of species and associated count of the records in the data? you can perform count min etc functions on group by data frames in the same way that you can on regular data frames so I'll give you one minute for this the answer is either obvious to you or it's not I don't think this is particularly deep um, but see if you can find an alternative way of getting that, that same answer Okay, so all it's getting at here is just what I was talking about a moment ago, really, is that you can often swap the order of this. So um, there's a question, Georgina, asking if we're going to stop at 11 a.m. for remembrance. Uh, what we could do, um, if there are uh, people who would like to do that, let's take our break uh, at 11 o'clock. And restart at 11:15 rather than um, uh, then stopping at 11:15. So that gives those who would like to to mark that um, a chance to do so at 11 o'clock. So, in fact, let us pause here and we can take a break, and uh, we will restart at 11 o'clock. All right then. Um, hello to everyone again. Uh, Let's make a start again because we've got a fair amount to get through. So we've got one more hour now until the next break. And I'm going to continue to, to move through this lesson. I'm going to possibly try to speed it up very slightly to make sure we've got time to, to cover the next part as well. Um, but as usual, do if I'm going too quickly, do uh, feel free.
free to interrupt and ask questions and, and so on. So, um, does anyone have any questions from the first part before I crack on with the next bit? If not, then I, I will. I will continue. Good. Okay. So, um, something given. Uh, questions. So the question, what is the difference between a method and a function? Okay, I probably, when I'm talking about it, um, switch breaking up a lot again. Okay. Uh, I think um, my bandwidth is showing us all right at the moment, so hopefully that, that was just temporary. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay again now. So to answer Ben's question, uh, what is the difference between method and function? I probably switch between these terms. Um, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't. Uh, method is is the more object oriented way of talking about things. Method is something that uh, belongs to the data frame object. So when I'm talking about methods. These are things that are. Um, that that you call with the dot after surveys.df. So they're, they're, they're functions that are provided by the data frame object, if you like. So that, that is the only real distinction here. A method is more object-oriented terminology. Function is a more general terminology. Um, is there any way to make pair plots in the analysis to compare the variables? Yes. Uh, so I think um, we will be come on to that shortly. It's something I'll certainly make sure I have time to cover at the end. Um, so I'll I'll do the other plots first, and then we'll, we'll come back to pair plots, because that's certainly useful. Right, um, good. So we were on this challenge, and it said, is there another way to do it? And the only thing it was getting at here is, that as, uh, as we did before, we can change the order quite liberally so we can do the we can do the count um on the group by object before we select the record id so that's all that it was getting out there um so another thing that you might want to do is sort of uh, work uh, apply the same function to do all values and you we can do this um, if, I, if I just take a at a particular column, we get a series, and I can apply some mathematical operation, like multiplying everything by two, the column, and then that just doubles everything. Um, so let's have a quick look at some plotting here. Um, it says, make sure figures appear in line in IPython notebook with this line. The later versions, you don't even need that line. Um, you see it begins with a percentage. That's not a not a Python command, but it's something that's interpreted by the IPython um, uh, the IPython interpreter. So whether you're using the IPython shell or whether you're using Jupyter notebooks, um, you can use some sort of special things that begin with a percentage sign that aren't normal Python, but they're interpreted at that level. But similarly, we showed the question mark syntax as well. Again, that is not um, standard Python as such that is provided by um, IPython. Um, anyway, we don't need matplotlib in line anymore, so we can go straight to. Um, so we had this thing species counts. I think we created that earlier on. What did that look like? Um, so that was just uh, our object. That, um, and if we want to make a bar chart out of this, we can do so um, with a command that looks like this, and it will plot um, something. Um, if I have time at the end, I'm going to go into a bit more detail about options for, for plotting. And I think it's worth bearing in mind um, here that there are there are two there are two sort of audi audiences for these kind of plots. There's two good reasons to be making plots when you're doing data analysis. One is for your own use. When you are doing exploratory data analysis, when you're trying to learn about your data, getting to know your data, 
I want to see what kind of thing is there. And for, for that kind of exploratory data analysis, it's useful to be able to plot lots of different kinds of things quickly. You know what you mean by everything. Um, so you can plot these pretty basic plots and leave some idea about the, um, uh, the data that you see. And the other, the other audience of these plots is if you're trying to do some, um, uh, if you're trying to communicate your results to other people. So if you were including these plots in a final report, or if you were sharing your notebook with other people, um, it would be, of course, good practice to make sure this was all nice and clear so you could see what the different species were without it being all bunched up. You label your axes, you've chosen the, the best way to present your data and so on. I've not really got time to go into all of that just now. Um, but suffice to say, some of the plots that we will see as we go through this course may look a little bit ugly. You might think, oh, I can produce a, a um, a better plot um, using Excel, producing a better plot using something else that I'm familiar with. You can make very pretty plots with this by tweaking all the parameters to the plot functions. And there are other libraries that are available for Python, uh, which are even better for that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, so you can do it, um, but we're not really going to go into detail of how to prettify or clarify your your plots today and that doesn't mean i don't think it's important labeling axes and putting legends on and titles it's very important but probably not when you're doing exploratory data analysis um says we can also look at how many animals were captured at each site uh, so uh, here's a suggestion for that um, so what did that thing look like? If I look at the total count now, and again, I have this one column of data with labels. It's the perfect kind of plot for a bar chart. So um, this, I can quickly see the total number of um, the total number of observations at each plot. So we have a, some challenge here, create a plot of average weight across all species or site. So, um, so let's just break this down. I'm, I'm just going to walk through this bit just now and we can, uh, you can try it out your, yourself as I go through if you want, um, but rather than weight. So let's create a plot of average weight across all species per site. So let's break this down, start with our data frame. Um, uh, as a whole, we've still got our surveys data frame, and um, we want to uh, average weight across all species per site. So it's per site. So we want to group by um, plot ID, and we want the weight and we want the average so let's have a look at what that thing looks like we're nearly there and now we want to create a plot of that and I can say plot k equals bar let me go on from that should give me the average weight across all the species in each site. Um, next one is create a plot of total males versus total females for the entire data set. So um, in this case, we'll start at the top level again, and we're trying to group by, um, by sex. Um, and we want the total number, so we're going to count it up. What does this kind of thing look like? And we're getting close, and we just want the total number of them, so we probably just want to count the record ID 
uh, record ID. And that didn't work. Why did it not work? Key error record ID because I think it has an underscore. It. Probably. Um, so that looks like the kind of thing we can now plot again. So we'll just take that and plot it. Right. Um, so next we're going to create a stacked bar plot. So that's one of these ones where we have uh, two bars on top of each other with weight on the y-axis and stacked variable being sex. So the plot should show the total weight by sex for each site. Um, and it's got some tips that kind of break this down on how to do it. So um, what we want is to create something that looks a little bit like this. Um, so the, the first thing that we want to do is to uh, so we want the weight, and we want the sex. So let's take our um, surveys data frame. Um, no, Dinesh, sorry, that um, square brackets. So we will come on to this next a little bit. So square brackets are a little bit like accessing an array. So Normally, it will pick out the column. In a one-dimensional object, they tend to be depicted on the screen like this. Um, and in a one-dimensional object, using the square brackets, it will just pick out the, like, so if I say number four of this, label four, it will pick out row four. Um, so in that case, the square bracket is picking out a row. Um, so the square brackets are, the, are used to select the thing, which is normally the column, but it can be the row. What we have in round brackets here are arguments to, me uh, arguments to methods or functions. So group by is a uh, method. And so we're, we're calling it group by. Um, and in what we want to group it by. So that's why we have the round brackets here. So round brackets are being used for function calls, for method calls. Square brackets are being used like the kind of array notation to, to pick out an element from your, your list. Um, all right, so uh, to go back to um, the stacked example. Um, We uh, let's see if I can get the sorry. So let, let, um, create a stacked bar plot with weight. So we're trying to pick out the weight again, and we're grouping by um, uh, grouping by sex. So group by sex. First of all. Group by sex and pick out weight. Let's see what shape that looks like. Um, or we haven't actually performed a summary yet, so we've still got one of these group by options. So um, we want to uh, um, Total weight by sex for each site. It's an odd thing you want, you want to do, but um, it's the total weight. Um, so that's the sum that we want. So um, but we actually want it grouped by sex and site and for each site. So we need a list here. Like we did before when we grouped by more than one object here. <laughs> Square brackets in this case are being used for list notation. So that's another place that you see square brackets. So we're pa passing a list into this method. And um, that didn't work. I need plot ID for site. 
Uh, now we're getting something close, um, but we want something that's in this shape. Um, because we have sort of everything on the rows here. We, so we've got all the females and then all the males down here. We actually want something that's in this shape. And um, it says that you can use the stack method to transform grouped data into columns for plotting. So try unstack on some data frames above and see what it yields. So let's use that hint. And we will try unstack. Now we get something that is looking a little bit more like it. Um, we've got, uh, we probably want males and females in the two columns and just sites going downwards. And we've kind of got it the wrong way around. So let's just swap this round. So we want plot ID. Oh, that paste is gone. Okay. So we'll take this out. We'll sw switch it around. Now we're getting something that's a bit more like it. So we have the plots going down the way and female and male uh, along that way. And now we can probably use this kind of syntax that we have here. So we'll call this um, my data frame. And, and then we'll say my data frame plot. We want kind bar, we want stacked equals true so this is a boolean value which is why there's no quotes it's a built-in type in python let's give it a title as well so the first step of trying to tidy it up a little bit um and we get something that looks like this so we get our stacked um bar chart so showing the total weight of all the uh, individuals that were found on each plot um, and we can uh, we can look at we can compare female and male and we can also compare the total value so that that kind of that's what the stacked plot shows you it gets it shows it helps you quickly see the total value but also see the breakdown between the different um, categories that you you want to list okay so this is um this is sort of the end of, of that part of the lesson. Um, so we've shown uh, that libraries enable us to extend the functionality of Python. So the library that we've been using in this case is Pandas. Um, so Pandas came as part of the Anaconda distribution, but you can download it from um, the web directly. Um, Pandas is probably the most popular library for, for working with data in Python. We've been looking at these data frame objects that uh, provide these nice uh, containers for tabular data that you can manipulate. Um, and they also have all the, the methods that you need, not only for, for grouping and for, for um, changing parts of the data and so on, but also for uh, plotting as well. So the plotting that it, that it provides is actually given by this thing called matplotlib. So the the pandas plotting is a, a wrapper for matplotlib. So you, matplotlib is the underlying graph library that is being used to produce these graphs. I mentioned earlier on Seaborn, which is another plotting library, and um, that does some nicer ones for um, uh, sort of communication visualization. That um, is also built on top of matplotlib. Um, so there are uh, you get this kind of layering of, of libraries built on each other as you, as you often get. We saw how to aggregate data using group by, and we saw some of the different kind of graphs that we could produce using this grouped data. All right, does anyone have any questions before I move on to the next lesson here? In that case, I will keep going. And we're going to move to our indexing, slicing, and subsetting data frames. So this is getting on to some of the questions that people were asking. How do I pick out particular rows in my data? And 
and things like that. And we'll also look a little bit more about um, this, this square bracket syntax and what people were asking around. So um, we're going to use the same data just so that it's familiar to us. And we're going to start by looking a little bit more. You've seen some of this before, but we'll just um, repeat it just to highlight a few things. So we're going to use square brackets to select a subset of a Python object. So if you've got a Python object, which is the whole data frame, there are various different ways that you can pick things out. So we can use the square brackets to pick out um, a particular column by name, and we can use that kind of syntax. As I said before, you can also use the dot syntax, um, but I recommend this one as it's less ambiguous. Um, and we can, as, as was asked in the question earlier on, yes, once we have a, uh, a data frame, we can um, assign part of that to, to another kind of object. So if we want to work with that column, object survey species and just work with one column now, if that is easy, whatever you want. Um, so, uh, so one thing that you might want to do is pick out, so generally speaking so far, we've picked out a single column. I think that's the only, we've only ever picked out a single column so far. Another thing you might want to do is pick out more than one column. So you can pass in a list so here we've got double square brackets. It's getting a bit confusing. The outside square brackets are the indexing into the data frame. The inside square brackets are the list uh, delimiters. So we are. Um, this allows you just to pick out two columns of the survey's data frame. And as you might expect, when you flip the order, that just presents the columns the way around. What happens if you ask for a column that doesn't exist? Well, as you might expect, you get an error. So if you see key error like that, it's probably down to a typo or something. So key error means that it can't find that column in the data. Um, here's a little, uh, a, a little reminder. Um, just in case, because you might be inclined to do things um, like, oh, I've created a list with my square brackets. I'm going to assign it to the word list. You can do that in Python. But list is actually also a sort of word, so it means something specific. In fact, it's the way that you can make uh, to make a list object out of a tuple, for example. If I say um, list of, uh, I don't know. This function on a tuple it looks like this with round brackets. Um, so again, and we've got another notation here. So round brackets, as well as being functions, can also be delimiters for tuples. So I've turned something which is a tuple in round brackets into a list which has square brackets. If I override list by making it a normal variable name and make my own list. And then I try to do the line above. It won't work. So this is just a reminder here in case you get tripped up. If you do Python lets you override what these labels mean, but then you can't use them for what they were originally intended for. So if you want a full list of uh, the identifiers that Python uses just so that you know to avoid them, um, you can go uh, to this link here. All right, so another thing that you might want to do is to extract a range based on a subset. So if you have a list of numbers here, A1 to 5, um, then what, what value does the code flow return? I think we touched on this earlier as well. Uh, A0 is going to return the first element, zero-based indexing. And similarly, A5 is going to give an error because this only goes up from A0 to A4. And of course,
course, this will also fail because length of A gives five. Um, so length, doesn't, it gives the length of the array. It doesn't return the index of the highest, uh, the highest index, okay? Um, another thing that we can do is to pu pull out particular rows. So this is where we, there's a question right earlier on, how do I work on particular rows of my data frame? Um, so the one thing that you might want to do is pick out rows zero to three, or zero to two, in fact, um, because this upper range is not included, um, which can, can catch you out. But you can think, of, so this is up to, but not including three. And now we're picking out these rows using this range operator. So that looks pretty similar to doing service underscore data frame dot head two, but we can also pick out things from the middle, which um, is a bit more versatile. Rows. 45 up to 58. Um, if I am just picking the first few, just doing the equivalent of, of head, I can miss off the first one, pick out but not including five. And I can also use this notation. And what this one does is pick out the last element. The last row of the data frame. Um, you can also pick out the last three rows and, and things like that. Um, so this next little bit is a little bit subtle. So it, it sometimes catches people out. So what we're going to talk about now is the idea of the difference between copying objects and referencing objects. So before we get on to um, data frames, um, we, we, I can maybe show you this, uh, what what the problem is here. So if I say if I start like this, just work with some simple variables. I'd say a equals. Okay. So now I'm going to set b equals a. Okay. That's what you expect. So what would be the value of B be? Three? Yep, that's what we expect. And then if I change A, what's going to be the value of B? I haven't changed B, so is it going to be four or three? It's going to be three. So this behaves probably like you expect. So A and B are just integer types. Um, here makes a sort of this signs to be the value of whatever is in A. I can subsequently change A and it has no effect on B. So let's have another, let's now go a little bit more complicated and say A is a list. Now we've moved from um, printer type, an integer, to a list type. So A is one, two, three, B equals A. Um, oh, I'm going to change A now to be four, five, six. The question is, what is B? What do you think B is? And we're still OK. B hasn't been changed. It behaves exactly as you would uh, expect. Changed A, but um, uh, but that was after I made the assignment to B. So B is still one, two, three. Okay, so that's fine. Now let's do something slightly different. A is one, two, three, as it was before. B equals A. Now I'm going to change one of the values of A. So now A is one or three. What do you think value of B is? The answer is is uh, 
one, four, three. So the change has been made um, to here. So this is this is the subtlety. In in this case above, when we changed the whole list of A, it made no difference to B. When we change an element of A, it did make a difference to B. Um, and that's because when we do this assignment here, um, B is actually getting what's called a reference to A. It's not copying A, it gets a reference to A. So when we update part of A, um, that also has a knock-on effect for B. So that may not be what you expect. It's certainly different from what you see for primitive types and for when you reassign the whole list. Um, I don't know if it's helpful to you. If you if you think about sort of B as, as sort of being a, a pointer to a point in memory, at this point we changed A to actually point to something completely different. At this point we didn't. So and we only changed the value of the first element in it, which is why B um, was also affected because we haven't actually changed A. We only changed A one. In this case we did change A. So that that you, that you may take you may need some time to try that out yourself and, and see what's going on. But that um, that's what's going going on here, and why you have to be a little bit careful when you're manipulating data frames sometimes. So um, so let's look at uh, we're going to reassign parts of a data frame now to see what happens. So. Uh, so let's. So we've got our original data frame surveys. Got data frame, and we're going to create a new data frame with the equals sign. We think we've created a new data frame. <laughs> um, we're using the equals sign, so I can now look at ref surveys data, and as you would expect, it, it looks the surveys data frame. But now I'm going to change part of it. I'm going to. Set rows zero to three to be zero. Um, and so now, if I look at it, I change the top three rows of the data frame. The thing to be careful about here was because this equal sign was actually giving you a reference to the original data frame. If I look at the original data frame now, which you think shouldn't have been affected, it is. The top three rows have also been set to zero. So, um, so that's something just to be careful of. When you create a new, when you think you're creating a new data frame with equal sign, um, you're actually creating a reference to the original data frame. If you generally, genuinely want something that is completely different, then you have to use this copy method. In this, it'll behave nicely. So sometimes you might want this with the equality to so that you can kind of have a different window on your same data that you might want to manipulate just a part of your data frame. It's quite common that that is something you want to do. But other times you just want a copy of it and you then you want to break the link. And in that case, you have to use the copy method. Um, so, so as it says here, that's enough of that. Let's create a brand new data frame from the original CSV file. Just, uh, so that's a little um, that you that you should be aware of. It's also sort of internally, in a way, how you can use this notation with the slice, because the slicing. As returning um, a reference to the original data frame. So when I update it, what I want it to happen is I just want it to update that slice of the, the data frame. Question Why does entirely reassigning A mean it uses a different part of memory? Um, 
I suppose the answer to that is when I create the, the const when I create the, the constant list um, one two three. Uh, I expect what's going on is that it makes the one two three in memory, and then makes a point to it. So a um, that changes what a points to. Um, Why does entirely reassigning an array mean the array is a different part of memory, but reassigning an element of an array manipulates the same memory? This is a Python or a Python thing. So that's a good question, um, Gavin. This is a Python thing. It's not a pandas specific thing. Um, you, uh, so the uh, what I the examples that I was giving here with lists and tuples and things. So that there's not, that's all pure Python. There's no pandas there whatsoever at all. So you can re, you can do all of this just in Python. It's got nothing to do with pandas. The copy method of the data frame is a pandas specific thing to let you get around that in the case of data frames. So um, I expect that there are other uh, that are probably the equivalent of a copy method. It's probably a copy method. So there is a copy method as well on uh, in, in pure Python. So um, so actually that's not a it, it happens to be provided for the, the data frame object in pandas, but um, it's quite common for an object in Python in general to have a copy method, um, which is used when it has to be it has to be copied. And so it's not really a, a pandas thing. Pandas is just doing it Python way. Why does Python do it? Um, it just does. Why do some languages call by value and some of them call by reference? Uh, it's just the way that Python has, has chosen to do things. Maybe some deep historical reason that I'm unaware of, but uh, I think you just, as a user, have to be aware of, of what it's doing in each case. Um, slicing subsets of rows and columns in Python. Um, so, so far we've been looking at So yeah, so um, Kono was um, uh, said it's possibly because it's based in C under the hood. A lot of Python uh, is implemented in in C, and but a, C is a bit more explicit, or at least uh, C is a little bit a little bit more explicit about it with what's a pointer and what is um, what is a, a value. Um, Oh, I've just seen my screen update really slowly on the left-hand side. Is there, I don't know if everyone else has seen that lag, or whether it's just me. Apologies if um, I'll be aware of that if uh, everyone has seen things much more slowly than I'm speaking. Um, what the use of the reference method? Anything we do and it will be done on the original object. Yeah, so sometimes you might want to do that. Sometimes you might want to create a, a reference to something. The classic example is when you want to manipulate a column in your um, your data frame, um, and you don't want you actually want to reset the values in your original data frame. You don't want um, uh, you don't just want to for that particular operation. You want you want it to last. So when I change, for example, the species ID row of my table. I want that of my data frame. I want that to be a kind of permanent thing. So although I refer to the the thing that uh, that's just a species ID slice, um, I want it to to remain a permanent change for my data frame. So, um, in the same way, sometimes you want to pass by reference 
in, in cases where you might want to use pass. So passing between functions is another um, is another time when when passing a reference around can be better than passing objects around. So working with references is, is sometimes better there. As Connor was saying, sometimes less memory is occupied because you're not making complete copies of everything. Um, and sometimes it's an efficiency saving because you don't have to copy values unless you actually want to make changes. So particularly if you're only wanting to perform read-only operations, which may not be the, which isn't what we've been doing here, but because we've been making changes. But sometimes you might just want to make a read-only copy of something. Um, and having the reference is a much quicker way to do that, particularly if you've got a large amount of data. So sometimes it's what you want to do to pass between functions, to operate on parts of an object, that, to do it in a permanent way. Um, sometimes it's an efficiency thing, either for memory or for um, speed. Um, so, so far, we've been using square brackets to pick out columns from the data. Um, and the other kind of thing that you might want to do is actually, we've used them to pick out columns. We've also used them to pick out rows by using a slide and using this notation. So another thing that you can do uh, is to use the dot lock method and the dot I lock method. So lock is label based. Confusingly, those labels can be integers, but you're still indexing them by a label. So lock is label based. I lock is integer based indexing. So I lock is a bit more like using you know, normal array indexing. Lock is for where you want to use the labels, which are the things shown in bold here. And column labels. These are row labels, which we haven't changed we've just got like the automatic key here which happen to be integers you can change row labels as well i don't think i'm going to have a chance to get into that just now but the things in bold your row labels column labels are the kind of things that you can use with um, label based indexing so this example is how you would um, so the integer based one allows us to do multi dimensional slices. So, pick out pieces and um, sort of squares or rectangles from our bigger data frame. So, saying pick out um, rows zero to three, excluding three, and column one to four, um, excluding four. So, I get uh, that. Okay. 0 to 3, excluding 3, and then 1 to 4, and that's 0. That's 1, 2, 3. So they are picked out. Um, so other things that you can do. Um, so now we're using lock here. Um, so we're just using a particular set of labels we're using labels here um and i use this notation so we're going to pass in a list so this is the list being passed in in square brackets and um, in this case it's just a list of labels so i want row zero and i want row 10. so i'm not saying from zero to 10 um, i'm not using the colon here i'm just saying i want label zero and label 10 so they both appear um, and for columns, the colon can be used to refer to every column. So that's what I'm getting there. What does this do? What do we think it does? So, um, so it looks like we've got labels here. Um, we've got two arguments. We've got a zero and a list. Uh, so zero looks like we'll pick out the row with label zero. And the columns, these labels. So, does this do what we expect? Yes, it does. Um, so, what happens with the code below? 
Now we have a label based indexing again, and we've got this list of labels. So we're going to pick out row zero, row 10, and row 35549, um, and all the columns. And we get an error. So what was wrong with that? Passing list likes to dot lock or square brackets with any missing label is no longer supported. Okay, so that was because, trick question. The labels in this data frame only go up to 35548. Um, we've asked 35549. So as you might hope, I suppose, if you ask for a label that doesn't exist, um, you get some kind of error. I think it used to work, but it doesn't anymore. And so for picking out a particular element, we can use uh, the notation at so up O3 and column five, remembering that we're counting from zero. Get element at uh, label three and label five. So an example from the negative, but uh, exactly equivalent. Okay. Uh, so what happens when you execute these? I'm going to keep going just to so we can cover as much as possible. And um, is a range then? Uh, so surveys data frame. So now is this going to pick out a row or a column? Well, remember we had this above. If we just pass a single slice in square brackets, it's going to pick out just row zero. Um, what's this one going to do? We're going to pass a slice again, a single slice in square brackets. It's going to pick out rows and it's going to pick out everything up to but excluding four. And when I use this, again, I'm passing in a range to the square brackets. Um, and it's going to pick out the rows and it's saying um, everything up to minus one. I don't know exactly what that does. So everything up to and excluding the last row, I think. Three five five four seven. Three five five four eight. Yes. So um, everything up to excluding minus one. Remember, was the way that we referred to the last row. Okay. Um, what happens when we call these ones? This is uh, now we're passing in two slices to. I lock, so we're getting rows zero to three and columns one to three. And in this case, we are. Uh, so we didn't, I don't think we've seen this before, but now we're doing labels zero to four and labels one to four. And it's saying, we can't do slice indexing on labels because um, we're looking for labels here on the columns, and there aren't uh, labels one for. I think I can do two months today. I can't remember. Like, okay, so that picks out um, everything from the column month to the column day. So it allows me to use this syntax if I want. So, so far we've seen indexing the square brackets to pick out a pit one particular thing, whether that's a row or a column. Um, we've seen using a range in square brackets. The last thing you can use square brackets for, possibly the last thing we're going to get a chance to look at, today um, is subsetting using a, a criteria 
so if you're, you're kind of doing, you can think of this almost like doing a query on your data frame. So in this case, I can say, um, me part of the survey's data frame where the year is equal to 2002. And so this just picks out all the values where the year is equal to 2002. Um, that shorthand syntax again, but again, I can fully do year is equal to 2002. It gives me the same. Um, so you do have to mention the data frame twice. It seems a bit uh, unusual. Why couldn't I just say where, where year is equal to? To uh, 2002. Well, what it's actually doing under the hood um, is it sort of doing this in two steps. You don't really need to see this, but um, what this part does is it returns an array of true and false. So, um, and what I'm actually using to query survey's data frame is not some kind of string query or whatever. All I'm passing in is an array of true and false values. And so when it's false, it doesn't return that row. And when it's true, it does return that row. So what, what you're building in here in square brackets is this array of true and falses. If that helps you work to understand what's going on, great. Um, if not, you can just remember that this is the syntax to use to um, to query it. And um, so similarly, I can say where it's not 2002. I can build things up into more complicated queries using Boolean operators like. And so again, that's just what is going on here is that in, it's just doing the normal Python and on the two lists of true and false. Um, and that, uh, and that's what is being used to to pick out the elements of this data frame. So this is the way it's normally used. Another thing you, you can sort of think of the trues and falses as being a sort of filter into the into the data set. So you can calculate your filter based on an entirely different data frame if you want. If you know that the ro the, the rows one data frame correspond to the rows in the other by number, then um, you wouldn't have to select your rows based on the contents of the survey's data frame. You could select them based on another data frame of the same shape, or at least with the same number of rows. Um, so uh, another thing that you can do um, is to uh, pick out. Um, you, can, you can say you can say is is in a list. So uh, if I want to pick out the species idea where um, where it's in, it's either a do. Or a PF, for example, I can use that kind of syntax, and it just picks out those cases where that is true. All right, so we're running a little bit um, out of time now. There was a question earlier on about so the, the, we've done a bit of plotting. We haven't got on to some of the other more complicated um, plots, but one thing somebody did ask about was a scatter plot, and they are really useful. So a scatter plot um, is plotting x against y points. And that's something that you you very commonly might want to see. So let's try and do a quick scatter plot of hind foot length um, and weight. So let's check out these two columns of the data frame. Um, so uh, we're picking up two particular columns. So we want to include these in a list. We want hind foot length. And next list is the weight. Let's put something like that. 
like, okay, we have quite a few not in numbers in here, but actually there are a good number of points as well. So would I plot that as a plot scatter point a plot? Actually pretty easy. Except it's not scatter requires an X and a Y column. I thought that's what I had. Out. He's an X and a Y column. Yeah. It's data frame. Um. So I need my X and Y as why does that not work? Is me trying to improvise? Um wonder if it's the not in numbers. I think so. So if I've got this object that has got an X and a Y value, scatter requires an X and a Y column. Do I have to specify those specifically? Um, Let my make it in the way. Let's uh, have a look. So it wants X and Y as um, uh, so this is a different a different method, plot dot scatter. So let me just try, maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Kind of scat so okay. Okay, great. Thank you to whoever um posted that. Ian, thank you. Um so so I do have to explicitly state what I want for my X variable and what I want for my Y variable. Um I was thinking I didn't have to do that, but uh, that's so. Uh, the browser is not letting me close the help. I'm just close this tab and reopen it. Saved the page, reopen the notebook. Um, it loads back in. Hopefully, scroll down to the bottom. We'll get back to where we were. Um, I guess I hadn't quite saved the last bit. So, so I was close. Plot kind equals scatter. And then I uh, we just needed the um, x is hind. And Y is point. So, yeah, the scatter plot very useful for looking at how one variable relates to another one. Are these simply labels? Yes, they are simply labels. So, um, I th um, so it's it's the column labels that it's using. Could I use uh, numbers to represent the different columns? I can't remember. I have to look at the plot documentation. Sorry. Um, it's good. It forces users to plot with labels. Yeah. So it's it's true. Um, it, but so that's a, it's a general comment about these things called, with data frames. Having the labels 
the labels kind of hang around with the data as you manipulate it. Um, and so uh, even when you're sort of copying parts of data frames into other data frames, even when you pick out a single column um, or a single row from your, your data frame, you tend, it tends to keep the labels with it. Um, so when you come to plot it or when you want to refer to it by label, the labels are still there. And that, that's another, that's why as well you can you often change the order of things because you're referring to things by label so they, uh, they persist. Right, so Juan, I think we were due to finish at 12.15. Correct, we have a lunch break yes. now. So in the afternoon, yes, nice. we focus on um, some archer specific stuff. Um, we're due to finish officially at 4 p.m. today, I think. Uh, I will be back at 4 p.m. in the room. If anyone does have any final questions, I'd be happy to take them then. So if there's anything else that you would like me to to do to cover, I can. Um, I can cover it then. Um, so uh, if anyone does have any final questions, I can take them. Otherwise, we can break for lunch. Nice if you cover on plots and exploratory analysis later. Um, OK, I'll, I'll see. Uh, so if I come back at uh, 4 o'clock, um, I can see what well, I can maybe show something then. Um, the, I'll, I'll see what I can do, Dinesh, um, as we might have to, to, to come back. Um, Juan, I don't know if there's scope for, for a more advanced Archer course on this later in the year. Um, I don't know if there's anything planned. I mean, there, there's certainly other things that we could cover. Um, one of the nice things about using Python is that it is the same language that opens up access to a load of machine learning libraries and things like that. So when you move beyond the basic exploratory data analysis and sort of data money, you're actually trying to do some predictive analytics, trying to build models and so on. Um, you're still you're still there working in Python with your your data frames and so on. So it, it means that you can uh, you can keep you can build on what you've, you've learned here once it comes to the um, you know, to the predictive modeling when you're actually trying to rather than just visualize your scan you might want to do some kind of linear regression through your points to actually build a model um, so there is a lot more that you could cover um, but I think you know, that's maybe scope for, for another course if there's something I can quickly cover on on pair plots later on Dinesh I will do so um, otherwise I might be able to or get a video or something for another course where I cover that. All right, thank you, Georgie and Dinesh. And we'll, we'll take that on board and I'll see. I mean, I, I know that the Archer trainings are planned out a little bit in advance, but we'll, we'll keep that in our back pocket and see whether we can do something later. Also, a reminder in, in a month's time, more or less, uh, there is a follow up session where you can uh, ask uh, questions and we can see uh, contents that uh, you may be interested in. Uh, could be in a month's uh, time. I can uh, send you later exactly the, the day and time of uh, that. Good. Um, OK, yeah, Dinesh, sorry I wasn't able to cover everything. Uh, we, yeah, we'll, we'll use this the follow-up session that Juan talks about, and I'll be able to point you at something um, a bit more uh, advanced later on. Also, all the material is online, and you can uh, the you can follow the material, and exactly in case that you have any questions regarding that material, uh, we can solve uh, these questions in the follow-up session. All right. I think we're we're done then. So Juan, we're restarting at what time? Uh, quarter past one. Quarter past one. Good. Um, so there's a question, Dinesh. Is there a discussion platform for us? 
Um, is the, the collaborative uh, the collab uh, the collaborative uh, path? I will share again the the link. That will persist after today, will it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that will last, and it also it means if people are watching the video, they'll still have access to the Padlet. Is that also true? Uh, the, the video will be uploaded to the Archer2 website uh, later this week, if that's the question. Yeah, okay. And, and so for the foreseeable future, for people who are watching this video later, um, they will also be able to go to the, the same pad and uh, ask a question there. Yes, we can include that in the description or where in the course material will be available. Okay, so this part, uh, please uh, use it uh, for, yeah, in case that you have any questions, comments, uh, also you can add uh, further resources that uh, you may have found uh, about the Python, Pandas. Uh, yes, it's a, a, a tool uh, to collaborate each other and, yes, uh, learn together. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Then, and I'll be, around, I'll be around again later on about 4 p.m. Otherwise, uh, I plan you to introduce the afternoon session. Yeah. Now. Thank you, and also, yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, have a nice uh, lunch break, and see you back at a quarter past one.